everyone, and welcome to the Source Talk Show. My name is Michelle Velasquez. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to the Source Talk Show. Joining me today is, My name is Michelle Velasquez. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to the Source Talk Show. Joining me today is, My name is Michelle Velasquez. Hello, everyone. Hi everyone, welcome to The Source. We're having a little technical difficulty, but we're so glad that you could join us today. My name is Tamika Tomlinson, the active president of the New England North Youth Federation. And with me today is... Youth Federation. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Velasquez and I'm so excited and so happy to be on The Source today. Please excuse um, our technical difficulties, but we are here and we're pushing forward. We're just going to pause just for a minute, if you can give us a minute, and we're going to pause for a second and just come right back. All right, we are back. Sorry about that. Um, we're back and ready to go. All right, we are back. Sorry about that. Um, we're back and ready to go. Right. Okay. Um, today, we have a very special program for you guys, and we're so happy that you could all join us on the Source Talk Show. Um, we have a very special guest that will be sharing his story today. Um, as we begin this new year, I'm sure a whole lot of us have had new resolutions that we're, um, you know, new year resolutions that we are hoping to set goals and to reach these goals in our lives. Um, Today, our, our guest is going to be sharing some of those, the journeys, the, the journey that he's taken in reaching some of his goals and the place that God had in his journey. So we can't wait to inviting him in. But before we even get to him, we are going to um, invite God's presence. So Tamika is going to pray for us. Let us pray. Dear God, we're just so grateful that you have once again allowed us to be in your presence. Lord, as we come to just have a conversation and just to hear a testimony, I pray, Lord, that someone that hears this will be encouraged today to go forth and to press on into 2022. We praise you and we honor your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. So happy new year, Jamaica. How was your new year? How is your new year so far? You know what? I'm just grateful to be here, um, overcoming all the obstacles of 2021 and just being able to, you know, be here and be able to live out that purpose that God has for me. So I'm excited about what is in store for 2022. And, you know, like I said, we're just going to press forward. 
and and leave all that baggage we had in in 2021 and i know sometimes it's easier said than done but you know um, by god's grace we can we can accomplish this what like about that. you by god's grace i like that my yep. god's grace yeah because god is the source of our strength he is the source of our dreams he is the one that brings everything to fruition and he gives us the courage and the strength to go forward so i'm looking forward to this new year with hope that god's strength is going to be the one that carries me through that's right we are going to take a look at our what's on your mind uh, we have a young person here that's gonna to answer this question for us and so let's take it away what's on your mind Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Duchesne. I am from Cambridge SDA Church in Everett, Massachusetts. And thankfully I have had the opportunity to share Christ with somebody at work. Um, last year I used to work at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, which is in Boston, Massachusetts. It's a cancer hospital. And one of my coworkers and I were discussing the unfortunate events of people getting cancer. Um, and we were discussing where Christ is in moments like those. Um, and we were thankfully able to exchange, you know, our own experiences with Christ and how even in the midst of such unfortunate events, you know, you could be the healthiest person and still get cancer, um, how Christ still shows up and he keeps us during those times. So I think the workplace is one of the most best places you can share Christ because these are people you see often every day. You can have such a good impact in sharing Christ with people at work. So, you know, I encourage everybody, if you can, um, whether it's in casual conversation or just sharing your own experience with Christ, just letting people know he's real and what he's done for you. You know, testimonies, personal experiences really resonate with other people. So just as I was able to share my you know, own experience or communicate with my coworker in such a simple setting, I encourage you all to do the same. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Beautiful. What a beautiful testimony. Um, you know, it's, it's easy when, when you, you, it's easy to show God, to show others who God is by the way we act and the things that we do. Um, but it's not so easy sometimes to, to speak to somebody about God, especially if you work someplace where, um, God isn't spoken of as, you know, easy and casually as, 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 um, if you're at church. So I don't know, for me, what about you, Tamika? Um, how have you sh shown God in your, on your job or in your career? Um, so, you know, in many instances, um, I was able to minister to my coworkers at, you know, various jobs that I've worked in, working um, in the school system. And a lot of times, even this past week, one of them uh, texted me, she was like, you know, can you just pray for me? And, you know, um, when, you know, I like this quote by Thomas Munson, it says, you can share your testimony in many ways by words, the way you speak, by the example you set, and by the manner in which you live your life. And, um, you know, I'm not perfect, but, you know, because they saw something in me and because, you know, they, they know the work that I do with, with my church, uh, Berea, they're able to, um, you know, see God in me. And they're able to reach out and say, hey, can you pray for me? I, you know, I'm going through this struggle and I, you know, I need, I need just some, some support in this, in this regard. And, you know, that's definitely a blessing when you're, someone can call on you and ask you, you know, to, to lift them up before God. That's definitely a blessing. Um, yeah. And you shouldn't take it for granted, you know, because, you know, each of us have our stories to tell. And it's important that we tell our story. No one else can tell our story for us. And so, you know, I'm glad that we we're able to do these testimonies and just hearing from people um, all their testimonies and their stories. What about you, though? Yeah, we, you, you know, know, the same. Yeah, the same. Yeah. We kind of do the same. Yeah. 
I like what you said about um, sharing your story because in your story, you can share hope. In your story, there is so much encouragement because if you can do it, I can do it by the grace of God. Um, for me, I well, I work with kids and um, all throughout my life, I've thought if you can start sharing God to the babies, to the kids, to the children, they can grow up knowing him. So I, for me, I share God in so many ways to, to kids because sometimes they ask questions about God. Um, if I have a story I'm, 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 I'm teaching them, I use Bible stories to share with my kids. And then from those stories, they will ask about God, you know, and that's my opportunity. Every day I have that opportunity to share God with my kids. So I, 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 I'm loving the fact that I can do that. I love that I can do that every day. So yeah, that's how I share God with my kids. That's awesome. And I know you work in like the, the Adventist school system. So, you know, there's some difference working in, you know, the public schools or other private school systems. So, um, you know, no matter what area you're in, whether it's school or in the hospitals, whatever it is, you know, there's an opportunity always present to, to minister and share a testimony with someone. Yep, definitely so. We're so excited today, right, Tamika, because we have a special guest that we would like to bring into um, the, the program today. Dr. Williams will be joining us. He is coming, you know, everybody knows him, hopefully. Um, for those of you who don't, you will get to meet him today. So we would like to pull in Dr. Williams. Please come in and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and then what you like to do for fun. I wanna hear the fun part too. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, and it's truly uh, an honor and privilege to be here with you. Um, uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So I, I grew up on the Caribbean island of St. Lucia. Uh, I grew up as not, not in, a, in a wealthy background, but a hardworking uh, background. Um, lots of love, not necessarily lots of money. And God has blessed me remarkably. I like to say I'm a product of Christian education. I, I went to Seventh-day Adventist Elementary High School, went to, I'm a graduate of Caribbean Union College in Trinidad, of Andrews University, of Loma Linda University. So I've really gone through the Adventist system. Um, I did my doctorate at the University of Michigan. Uh, at the time, uh, University of Michigan was one of the top three departments in my field. Um, and so that the foundation in Christian education does not um, uh, block you if you are, do your best at everything you do um, from being, um, getting into a, a, a really top school. Um, and then from the University of Michigan, when I graduated, I have been a faculty member for over 30 years at three of the best universities in the United States, uh, Yale University, University of Michigan, and Harvard University. I've been at Harvard now for 15 years. Um, and I am in my field, uh, clearly uh, at the top of my field um, is the only way to put it. Uh, I am ranked as the most cited black scholar in the social sciences in the world. That's in all of the social science disciplines. Citation counts uh, are a measure of impact of a scholar's work, how much other scholars have to cite and, and, and refer to your work in doing their own work. Um, so that is an, an amazing honor. Um, I give God the glory. Um, and uh, I, uh, to give an example, um, in the last year and a half during the pandemic, I have been on every major news network in the United States, except Fox News. I was invited to be on Fox News, but it was at 1 a.m. And I thought I was not gonna get up in the middle of the night to be on Fox News, but I've been on CBS and CNN multiple times and MSNBC and ABC Evening, ABC News and NBC Evening News and uh, BBC and Australia Broadcasting and, and on and on and on. Um, so um, I, I think I'm a highly regarded social scientist who studies health and social influences on health. And God has blessed me beyond my wildest expectations. Yeah. Dr. Williams, I want to hear the fun part too. What do oh, you do for um, fun? <laughs> um, what do I do for fun? I think one of, of my most fun things to do is travel. I love to travel. I love to travel with my family. I love to take advantage of, of academic research-oriented events 
and make it a family event. So some years ago, for example, my kids, as a result of one of those events, my whole family went to Australia for two weeks, for example. But I, I gave eight presentations within those two weeks. So I had a, a two-day meeting in, in um, Hawaii, and we made it a week and a half vacation in Hawaii. So I, I love to... I love to travel and I love to extend. Uh, I've been uh, directed a, a large research project in South Africa and I've been able to, I've probably been to South Africa about 18 times, but I've also been able to take my family on multiple trips to South Africa. So I think traveling, meeting, meeting people from different cultures, meeting different uh, contexts, even sometimes when I have a, a conference and I couldn't take the whole family, sometimes my, my, my oldest daughter was in, was in college and I had a, a trip to Budapest and it's coincided with her spring break. And so she came with me to Budapest or my second daughter came with me to Athens, you know, where, where you, 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 you lengthen something and make it a bigger event and, and include family. So I think fun um, uh, is, um, travel is one of my biggest fun items. Awesome. Well, welcome to the source. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you. Um, just want to remind our viewers if um, just feel free to put in the chat where you're watching from. We'd like to know who is watching and where you're watching from. Feel free to put that in the chat and feel free to share this program with someone else. It's going to be very inspirational and very encouraging. So we ask you to share, share, share and subscribe to the channel so that we can bring more programs like these. All right, let's get ready to jump right into our conversation. So you've pretty much shared um, a little bit about your beginnings um, and how you got started. Now, what, how did you get started on the journey towards where you are right now? I think I had no, I would put it this way. I had no idea where I was going. Um, I never had a clear plan. I never dreamed that I would be where I am now. Um, mm -hmm. I think the key for me was to follow God's leading step by step. Um, and God had a plan, obviously, um, that where I didn't. Um, so just, just to be concrete, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, when I went to college, um, it's a long time ago, but I actually thought of four years as a long time. And I thought when I enrolled in college that Jesus was going to come before I had graduated from college <laughs> because four years sounded like a really long time. Um, so I, I had no plans to do anything more when I went to college beyond college. While in college, one professor pulled me aside one day and he says, I think you have a lot of ability. I think you could, should go on to higher education. So he was the one who inspired me to go on to study at Andrews University. I, it was not me, but he pulled me aside, gave me this suggestion. And I thought, OK, you know, and. I, I, I did that. The other thing that's really important is how did I do that? I, never, I didn't have the money to go to Andrews University. I didn't have any relatives in the United States. I, I had no wealthy financial backers. So how I was struggling to pay tuition in Trinidad, how do I go to Andrews University? Um, and that's when another faculty member who had a huge impact on my life in terms of helping me think about what is possible. And that was uh, a pastor who died um, in the last two years, um, Dr. Kimbleton S. Kimmel K.S. Wiggins. Um, he, I knew him as an evangelist in the Caribbean Union, but I also knew him as a teacher of mine in college. And what he taught me was faith. He taught me that the most important thing is life, is knowing what God wants you to do. And that if you are doing what God wants you to do, God is going to open the door. He would always say, if God asks you to jump through the hole in the wall and you look at the wall and you don't see a hole, your duty is to jump. It's God's problem to make the hole in the wall. So <laughs> I think he did inspire me to, to, to not use my resources to think of what is possible, but to really get in, in tune with God's vision for me. So when this other professor told me, go go on to study, if I hadn't, the, the, the thinking, if Pastor Wiggins hadn't expanded my mind, I would have said, that's a crazy idea. I don't have the money. I can't do it. But, but given his orientation that 
if God wants you to do something, he can open the doors. Well, I had heard of other West Indians who had made it by going to Canada and working as literature evangelists and raising money during the summer to go to school. And I said, well, if they've done that, why can't I do it? And so that became the path that I used to go. And it turned out to be much more difficult and much more problematic than I thought. But it's an example of where God opened the door, um, but I stepped out in faith in response uh, to his encouragement. And I have so many examples in my life of, of chance occurrences. Let me give you one more. I went to the University of Michigan to do my doctorate. Um, because the University of Michigan is one of the leading research universities, not just in the US, but in the world. In the social sciences, it's arguably one of the strongest universities in the world. Um, I had no clue about university. So my wife and I are married now. I'm living in Battle Creek, Michigan, working at the Adventist Hospital as a health educator. And we go to church one Sabbath, and I see one of my professors from Andrews in the audience, uh, he and his wife. And we have a little one bedroom apartment and you know, but we invited them home to dinner. And that chance meeting, he says, David, what are you doing? When are you planning to go on to do a PhD? And I said, well, I wanna do it sometime. And he says, well, where are you planning to go? And I said, well, I don't know, Western Michigan University, which was closest to home, has a degree, Michigan State has a degree, uh, University of Michigan has a degree. So I, I really was clueless, clueless about the American system of higher education and, and that where you get your advanced training affects where you can end up. I, I knew I was clueless about that. And he said to me, you need to go to University of Michigan. So that's a chance occurrence. It was, he, didn't regularly, his mother, his father-in-law was sick in the hospital and they'd come to town to visit that person, showed up at the church, we happened to invite them to dinner and that piece of advice changed where I, would, where I went to school and that <laughs> changed the trajectory of my career. So it's an example of how God uses little opportunities and, and being faithful to God in, in little things, he opens opportunities down the road. Mm -hmm. And I like, and I like that, you, that say, you say a lot of times, times we put God in a box, right? And think that he's not able to, to move outside of that box. And I love that you're saying, you know, humble beginnings, but look where God has brought you. You know, I was reading that you did over 500 publications and, you know, like you said, sought off um, sought after over the, this whole world. You've been so many places and have done so many um, projects. Um, and so that's a testament to someone that's watching, you know, you, God is, has called you or has told you to do something and you're saying, I can't do it. You know, um, is there something or someone that impacted your life, um, Dr. Williams, um, in your early years? I know you mentioned one person and, and that, that providential, um, instance that you invited someone to lunch, but is there like someone else that, really, you know, impacted your life um, in your early years? I would say my parents. Um, uh, neither of my parents, when I was growing up, went had gone to high school. Mm -hmm. um, but that may be very misleading because both of them were avid readers. Um, they studied well. They were avid lay people. My father was always a first elder. My mother was a Sabbath school superintendent. Um, they were both gifted speakers. Um, and even though my father had never gone to high school, he took correspondence courses in Greek. So when I went to college and, and was taking a class in Greek, I knew the Greek alphabet because my father had us running around the house singing alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. You know, so, so it's misleading when, yeah, he didn't go to college, but he took a course in auto mechanics. He, you know, um, and, and, and my mother um, is an example. And I'll tell you one story about my mother that illustrates the kind of person she was. We didn't have much at home, but we had books. They both believed in reading. In the summers, we spent a lot of time reading in addition to other things we might do. And my mother, when all of her children grew up and had gone to college, she came to the United States. And she called me one day and told me that she wanted um, to go to high school. And I said, why do you want to go to high school? She's in her 50s now. 
why you want to go to high school? I said, there's something called the GED. You can take the GED. You don't have, she says, no, she doesn't want to take any GED. She wants to go to high school. And so I said, I'll look into it. She called me up the next week. She found a high school in Chicago that had a correspondence program and she would take it. She took it. Her dream from childhood was to go into nursing. And my mother, when she was about 60 years old, I flew to Minneapolis to attend her graduation from nursing school where she was the valedictorian of a class. So um, it, it's an example of, I think it's the spirit that they had They never pushed us, but they always had high expectations of us and always grounded us in, in, in the fact that with God, all things were possible. Um, so I, I do think that the, the, the socialization I got at home uh, beginning every day with God, realizing that all things were possible with God. There's something else they had us do. We all had chores. We had a lot of work to do. We we had um, grew up on five acres of land, and and my mother and father turned it into a little economic enterprise where we had two cows that we milked cows in the morning and and gave milk, sold milk to, I mean, dropped off the milk. The, the neighbors that had an agreement to get milk from my parents on the way to school and and took care of, of sheep and turkeys and chickens and other animals and, and, and grew, my father grew, grew bananas and so on. So it, it was one of the things I learned which has worked well in life was learning to manage time. Because if you're gonna get up and do chores and still walk to school and get to school on time, you better be efficient else it's not all gonna work out. So learning how to manage time and learning how to make the most of time as I reflected on my life is one legacy that my parents also gave me. Wow, beautiful. I mean, it's it shows, you know, you're not afraid to get your hands dirty. You gotta get down and take care of the animals. And, you know, that was early teaching that your parents instilled in you. Um, I just remember, for me, like when I when I went to college, one of the things that we had to do was manual labor. That was a part of our curriculum. We had to do gardening or some kind of manual labor that was added to our um, our our classes every week. So I mean, there is something to say about being able to get down and do chores, you know, and and that builds and instills that work ethic that is needed to, to be successful in life. Now, um, Dr. Wilms, you, you chose to do sociology and you saw us, you chose that area in sociology and public health. Why? Um, again, I would say it's, it's, it's the Lord's leading in, in many ways. So my first degrees were in theology and in studying theology, I, I, I learned about health. I read um, what Ellen White said about health and um, and the role of health um, as as part of effective ministry and witnessing and service to our communities uh, for Jesus, and that led me to do my masters in public health. Um, I was open to working from a church base in developing health programs. An opportunity didn't open up, but an opportunity opened up for me to work at a Battle Creek Adventist Hospital. That was the very first Seventh Day Adventist Hospital ever. Uh, where Dr. John Harvey Kellogg uh, invented cornflakes and invented granola and coined the word granola. Um, so I was steeped in this background and, and that history um, uh, there in Battle Creek. And in working in, in Battle Creek, the hospital was located, um, the community around the Adventist hospital had changed. It was now in the black community. Um, yet, even with the community programs we offer to the community, um, most of the people who would come were white. We were not reaching the black community. And I remember um, being kind of very frustrated with that. And there was a, a pastor of an AME church just a few blocks uh, from uh, the Adventist Hospital. And I went to meet with him to talk about how I can be work with the community and how we can connect with the community, how we can get a community to come to some of the programs we were developing at the hospital. And he invited me to come to his church on Sunday morning and give me time in the 11 o'clock hour to introduce me as a new health professional in town and to share with the church. And I got lots of amens and so on, but it didn't change what happened. And then one thing I discovered was what I was doing was trying to get the people to come to us. What if we would go to where the people are? 
this minister's church was like the community center. Everybody was there for different programs and services. He had job related, job training surf classes, and he had uh, lunches for senior citizens and so on. We had a, a like a blood pressure clinic that we offered once a week. I, I managed that at a hospital, and only white people would come to it. I now moved my blood pressure clinic uh, two days a week to this church and set up a table and I would be screening, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 uh, black people, but I went to where they were instead of waiting them to come to where I was. And one of the reasons I always was interested in sociology, psychology, the social sciences, um, trying to think of how we could be more effective in the work we did for God. And um, I was unhappy with the fact that I don't think I was trained well to, how do I meet the needs of poor people? How do I need the needs of minority populations? How do I help them with the challenges they face? And I thought the discipline of sociology would be one that would provide me with the skills and understanding to be more effective. And for me, it's always been about ministry. It's always been about making a difference in the lives of others. So that led me um, to my, my doctoral work in sociology, which I have focused on within health. So I'm called a medical sociologist. Uh, but but the, the, the inspiration is being more effective in understanding people, understanding their challenges, and making a difference in their lives. So, wow. so, so then that, that would mean then that your, your ministry and your career, you would, would you say that they're the same thing? Then. That's correct. I, I, I mean, I, I, in my ministry, I don't, uh, in my, in my academic work, I, I don't get up and preach because that would not be appropriate. But I do think that my motivation and what I am trying to do is to help empower, enable individuals and use my voice to be an advocate for others. L let me give an example. Probably what I am best known for in the world is that I developed a measure, measures of discrimination. And one of the scales I developed is now the most widely used scale to measure racial discrimination in the world and to document that the way in which we treat others have negative effects on health. It was featured on 60 Minutes when I, I did an interview with 60 Minutes. Um, so what, why, why did I do that? Because I thought that if we looked at the challenges the African American and other populations of color face in the United States and around the world, with the current ways researchers were thinking about it, they were missing some of the important factors that were having a negative impact on our lives. And I wanted to both document that this mattered, to raise awareness, and, and to think of what we could do um, to intervene. And I remember speaking at a conference in 1992 in Washington, D.C., and they were, I was asked at the end of the conference to comment on what would be some of the priorities for the future. And I said one of the priorities is for us to document the ways in which racism affects health. And a white gentleman got up and he says, well, what Dr. Williams said is a good idea. He agrees that racism is something that's important, but what he's asking us to do is impossible. We can never measure racism. And I said, if you ask me today, do we have good, valid, reliable measures to use? I'd say no. But I said, we measure self-esteem. We, if we measure self-esteem, why can't we measure racism? We just haven't put our minds to it. And it was that was likely like a little kick that 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 further motivated me. I went back and I started to read qualitative descriptions of racism and think of how could we develop a skill. And I worked with another colleague who helped me and we worked together and developed these scales that are now widely used. And now just from my scales, there are more than 500 studies published worldwide just using the scales that I have developed. And we've documented racism is a factor that predicts poorer health above income and education in the United States, in the UK, in South Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand. They've just done the largest studies of the Aboriginal population in health study in, New Ze in Australia using the scale that I developed and we published papers documenting the negative effects of discrimination on their health. So it's an example of where you, you are addressing the needs and the problems that people face and trying to make a difference in their lives. 
Mm. Yeah. Very profound. That's the, the everyday discrimination scale. Yes. That's that's what it's called. Yes. And it, and it, just to give you an example, it captures. It doesn't capture all aspects of mm. of discrimination. Just a little indignity. You've been treated with less courtesy and respect than others. You receive mm -hmm. poorer service than others at restaurants or stores. People act as if they think you are not smart or if they are afraid of you. You know, it's just nine items, just, but just little indignities. And what we find, those little things, mm -hmm. if you score a high level, African-American women who score high on everyday discrimination are more likely to get breast cancer, studies show. Mm -hmm. More likely to get people, diabetes. More likely to get heart disease. More likely to be obese. I mean, it, it predicts, in addition to poorer mental health, but it also predicts literally physiological changes in our body. And it's an example of consistent with a larger literature on stress, that a stressful life experiences matter profoundly for health. And what I and others who followed my lead and others who are working alongside me have shown is that the stress of discrimination is just one type of stressful life experience that historically we had neglected. Mm -hmm. wow. well, I'm glad that you're bringing, uh, bringing that, that to light because like you mm -hmm. said, you know, there's a lot of people of color walking around with stress and trauma, that's you know, exactly. from the nation and mm -hmm. stuff. So mm -hmm. that's amazing, amazing, amazing. So we, we, we deal with that in our world today. Would we have that issue in our church too? We do, and I, I do try to talk to my church where, when there is opportunity. Um, I, I, I believe that um, I, I, w one of my professors in, in college in Trinidad, he said to us, when you go out in the Lord's work, never forget it's the Lord's work, but it's Paul and Silas running it. Um, and Paul and Silas had their, their conflicts. And, and what he was preparing me that is helpful is that even though um, I, I truly believe that the church is God's church and that God is in charge, but they are, there's, they're humans uh, running it and, and then it isn't perfect um, and, and there are problems. And one of the things God wants us to do, obviously in, in a positive, supportive way, but to raise awareness levels of the problem and try to be part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And I, I have tried to raise my voice um, within the church in terms of raising important issues linked to race, racism, racial inequities, uh, and so on within the church itself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you allowed, um, in your earlier years, you allowed the spirit of God to lead you because you've done something so important. You've brought to light these important issues that maybe if you hadn't been led or allowed God to lead you in this path, you would not have been, been, been able to do and you would not have had this information today. So I'm grateful that you allowed God to lead and you took that leading and you went in faith. Now, can you share any other experiences that you've, well, an, an experience that you, you've had that you never imagined yourself being a part of as you are in your career right now? Well, I'll give you two examples, or maybe just a couple examples that I would never. Again, I, I had no, <laughs> it's, it's God. I mean, people ask me, how, how did you do it? I didn't do it. God did it. I mean, he's led me step by step. Um, but I would give you a couple examples. Um, there, there's an organization in the United States called the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, think of it as the Hall of Fame uh, for um, health and medical professionals in the United States. Um, in, I got elected to that organization when I was in my late 40s. The typical age of election is around when people are 60 years old, and they only elect 60 people in the United States each year. So it, it, it's a huge, enormous honor. I am the second Seventh-day Adventist ever elected to it. I was elected in 2001. Dr. E. Albert Reese, the Dean of the Medical School at University of Maryland, and a Black Seventh-day Adventist like myself, he comes from Jamaica, was the first. Um, Dr. Benjamin Carson was elected in 2010. So even Albert Reese, and Dr. Reese and myself were elected long before Dr. Ben Carson, although I think he's better known um, within the church and, and, and globally than we are, but in terms of the impact that we've had on it. And then in 2019, I was the first Seventh-day Adventist, even higher than the National Academy of Medicine, is the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2019, I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. That's even uh, in the highest stratosphere. 
Um, and I am the first and only Adventist ever elected in history to the National Academy of Sciences. So I, it's an example of things that never have. I'll give you another example. Um, I, a, 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 a lady in England saw a video that I had had um, a, a lecture I'd given at the University of Massachusetts Amherst actually, um, and started to correspond with me. And then I had a trip to England and she said, well, can you come early and do something for the National Health Service, which has led me to be very heavily involved with the National Health Service in England. And I'll give you one example. Um, I was uh, elsewhere in Europe and I came through London because they wanted me to come to give a lecture. Um, I was invited by one of the members of the House of Lords to come to one of the auditoriums in the House of Lords in the UK. That's the equivalent of the US Senate um, uh, to give a, a lecture. Um, and, uh, um, and so I had a picture with him and another lord took me into an actual session of the House of Lords in the UK. I grew up when St. Lucia was a British colony when I grew up, so I understand the significance of the, the British Parliament. Uh, it's just an example of I would never have thought in my life that I would have been given a lecture in the House of Lords in, the, in London, England, um, I, I, just, just, just as, as an example. But you know, you could go on and on. I never thought I would, I love this show 60 Minutes. I never thought that I would be a guest on 60 Minutes. Um, they came to town last year um, and, uh, well, year before actually in 21. Uh, the program was aired in 2021, but it was taped in 2020 um, and, and interviewed me for an hour, although there's a short segment that is done. But it's just, uh, I think God has just opened opportunities. I, you know, I, I collaborate with people in, in the country of Chile and South America and Brazil and in Australia, in South Africa. I, I never had any expectations of any such things in my life. So I would say God has blessed me beyond my wildest expectations. I noticed um, there's a, a comment here. Some young people need to hear this. It is good to be faithful to God always. Um, Dr. Williams- Can I comment on that? and his friends I, from the yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a really, really important point. Um, uh, Pastor Winsley Phipps says it well. He says, you don't have to compromise to be recognized. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes um, it's easy to think if you are going to be successful, you have to give up some of your principles because you're not going to be successful. So I'll give you one example that I encountered early in my career, it's, I still encounter it all the time, and that is observing the Sabbath. Um, mm -hmm. In um, uh, academic life, many conferences, many meetings, many symposiums are held on Saturday. And I would get invitations, and early in your career, those are golden. That's how the big movers and shakers in the field get to know who you are. That's how you become exposed. So when you get those opportunities, you absolutely want to take advantage of them. And I know Adventists who feel professionally you need to do it because else you're hurting yourself. And I, I thought long and hard about it, but decided, um, no, I, I would be faithful. I, I can think of, I'll give you one specific one. I was invited to serve on, on the Board of Overseers for, um, uh, it's a National Science Foundation, it's a large uh, funding agency, that, and they have a project at the University of Chicago called the General Social Survey. It's the number one social indicator survey in the United States. To serve on that committee, it's a four-year appointment. It's with the movers and shakers in the field. The problem was the committee meets on Sabbath afternoon and Sunday, uh, you know, four times a year. Um, you know, and I, I got the invitation. This is this is this is this is golden. I, I want to do it. And you know, one one the one the devil whispered to me. You know, you could fly to Chicago. The meeting is in Chicago. I lived in Detroit, in the Michigan area, so you could fly to Chicago, go to church Sabbath morning, and go to the meeting Sabbath afternoon. It was a big deal of going to the meeting Sabbath afternoon. And I thought, no, the Sabbath afternoon is still Sabbath. And I contacted the director who had, had offered me the, the, this position to serve in that capacity and I explained to him that I observe seventh day, um, the Sabbath uh, the, as a seven day is a religious day for me and, and it's important. 
I, I told him that I would love to, to accept the invitation, but I didn't think it would be fair to him if I accepted it and I would only be able to attend on Sunday and I could never attend the meeting on Saturday afternoons. But that, that was my position. And, um, you know, I, I said it wouldn't be fair to him, but I would love to do it. But that, that is my restriction. I could never be there on, on Saturdays. And he wrote me back. He said, David, thanks for letting me know. We will honor your Sabbath. Um, you just uh, join the meeting every Sunday. I will ensure that especially the areas, um, items on the agenda where your expertise is particularly important will always be on the, on the Sunday um, uh, discussion uh, on the Sunday agenda and not on the Saturday agenda. And I did that for four years. And But it's an example of where sometimes you feel, I can't do it. They wouldn't. And, you know. Be, be bold, be like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Be bold and ask for God. And it's just an example. But I, I, I get to witness about the Sabbath all the time because even all the time I get invited to do things on Saturday, and I am able to write back that I observe the Saturday. It's a twenty-four hour, hour weekly mini holiday. It is a Sabbath. It's for physical spiritual and mental uh, refreshment and and it's something that i can't uh, accept the invitation for the saturday event look at god i mean mm -hmm. you know when you stand for him it doesn't hinder you from being That's successful right. like you said it does to compromise to be recognized it all has to compromise so that's a word today. If someone needs to hear that word. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions for Dr. Williams, go ahead and put it in the chat as well. Um, so that we can, you know, he can answer those questions for us. I like I like that he he talked about the Sabbath because it just led me to the next question that we were gonna ask you was how were you how have you been able to share God on your in your job? And um, do you have any other experiences where you've had to where you had the opportunity to share God with someone else? Sure. I mean, there are many opportunities that arise, but I, I would say the, the, the couple things that I think is important. It's uh, for, for me, sharing God is not just about what I say, but it's who I am. So sharing God depends on how I treat people and how I relate to others um, and, and how I stand for principle. I'll give you uh, I'll give a couple examples. One example, I remember when I was a faculty at the University of Michigan, I was serving on a committee, and this committee determined which faculty were eligible to get this. It was a huge benefit that they would get uh, access to a research project that, that was the equivalent of several hundred thousand dollars. And I'm on this committee that would decide that. And there's another member of that committee, and uh, there is we are reviewing the applications and making a decision of who should be awarded this. And he comes up with one reason why this applicant we were discussing should not get this. But it's not a criteria we have used in the past. Now, for me, it's just about fairness. I wasn't in favor of that applicant per, per se, but it's just like, let's use the criteria that is fair and across the board and we consistently use. And I said, no, but that's not a criteria we can use. We can't use that as a reason to deny him this. Well, he says he came up with a second reason. And I said, again, that is not a criteria. And he came up with a third reason. And again, it was not a criteria. And, and he may, I, I don't know what he thought initially. He was getting increasingly angry and frustrated with me. And eventually he said, I just don't want him to do it. And so, okay, that's fine. But then say that, don't use these fake criteria of why he should or shouldn't do it. But he ended, left that meeting with me visibly upset and angry because all I had done was be fair and equitable and apply the criteria we use consistently. To my shock, six months later, there's a problem in the department. This man walks into my office. He says, David, here is this problem. I know you are fair. I know you you do what is right. Can you help us solve this? I, I, I nearly collapsed because I knew that man was so upset with me. And, yes. and six months later, he comes to me as to help solve this issue because I know you are principled and you are fair in what you do. That's, that's an example. Um, I can think of another example not that long ago, where a staff person uh, came to me. She knew, I mean, people know, uh, let me put it this way, among my academic colleagues, I would say most of them are atheists or agnostic. 
So they've been being religious. They know it. I don't obviously try to to say anything upfront with them, but I, I try to live a certain life that they can mm-hmm. see it. Um, and they, they think it's well. Everybody's entitled to their strange beliefs if they want to, but but they 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 don't identify with it. Um, but they think he's good. I, I I you know he's 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 good, but but there's this this stuff. And mm-hmm. I remember late one afternoon, one of my staff persons coming to me and telling me, um, um, can I, will you be after work? Can I come by your office? And I said, sure, no problem. And she came by and she says, I need you to pray for me because of some challenges she was facing in the department on her job. And she felt I was and I was surprised, but I, I certainly prayed for her and, and spoke to her. But it's an example of out of the blue sometimes, you, you know, the life you live and, and the, 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 what you stand for. Um, and that she came and said, I, I need you to pray for me. Mm-hmm. And we don't sometimes we don't think it, but people are watching, you know, they people are absolutely watching. watching. They yeah. see what we do. Um, you know, I've, there's there's times when you slip up and they're like, uh, Tamika, what are you doing? Aren't you a Christian? You know, they'll they'll put you on blast. So yes. people are, mm-hmm. are watching it. They see, yeah. um, see, see, see what you're doing. So, um, but that's powerful that, you know, she feels comfortable enough to come to you. Because sometimes yeah. we, we can be so cold that people don't feel comfortable being in our presence and asking for for help or asking for prayer. So that's a, an amazing testimony. Do you have like um, some advice you wanna share with a young person or even an older person who might be stuck, you know, feeling discouraged in their journey? Um, what What's like lesson can, that you've learned in your journey that you can share with them? It's, it's really good. It is to realize that, you know, you are a child of God. You pray to God and ask him what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go. And, and sometimes we think that we have to struggle to find out God's will. No, we need to struggle to be willing to submit to whatever God wants us to do as opposed to we have our own agenda that we want to pursue. And, and to realize that wherever God leads you, he's going to open the doors. I'm not saying it's going to be easy because I've had challenges and difficulties even in trying to do what God wants me to do. But he has always come through. He has never uh, let me down. So I I would say, first of all, is, is make that commitment that not what I want, but what God wants for me is what is most important. And and realize, you know, um, when we commit ourselves to him and we trust in him, he will bring it to pass for us. The other thing I think is so important is make a commitment to always do your best. It does not matter what job it is you're given to do. Um, along my path of working, I have cleaned bathrooms, I have mopped floors, I have swept floors, I've worked in dishrooms. It doesn't matter what it is, but always, but but even in, in the context I'm thinking of that place where I started out mopping the floor and, and working in the dishroom and doing that, I every semester I got promoted, I got promoted to something else because I was a good worker. And 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 one of my motivations, if we think of the life of Jesus, Jesus spent most of his life working as a carpenter. And if we step and think about that, that seems to be like a waste of talent. And what was God thinking when he led Jesus? When Jesus was 12 years old and he went to the temple and he had the rabbis and all the scholars, you know, befuddled by all the the brilliance that he had, why did God send him back for the next, you know, almost 20 years working as a carpenter? It, It doesn't make sense. But in Desire of Ages, I read and read that Jesus sought to do his best work in every line. He was as perfect a workman as he was in character. Why? Because he was doing it for God. And if you try to always do your best, people notice it. People notice the quality of what you do 
and God will open doors for you. Don't try to cut corners, but try to do your best, not because you're doing it for your boss, not because you're doing it for to please your supervisor, to please your parents, to please somebody else. In every opportunity you have, you are doing it for God. And if you do that, um, you know, there's so many texts in the Bible that, that, that promise, seest thou a man diligent? He will stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. And I, I didn't talk about that, but I have served on uh, President Clinton had a, a, com uh, uh, a commission on race in the country and the White House put together a social science advisory panel on race for the President Clinton's initiative. And I served on that. And I was one of the, the external scientists who served on President Clinton's task force on healthcare reform. So even at a national level, God has given me opportunities to have my voice play a role in policy. I've, I've testified at congressional briefings, for example, and I've served on advisory committees where I've been appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So again, I think it is being diligent, being faithful in little things, and God will make you ruler over many things. Wonderful. It looks like we have a question in the chat. It says, powerful testimony, Dr. Williams. Our youth have often have limited, pers I can't see that, perspective on career paths. You've taken an atypical path with great success. What advice do you have for youth to find their calling? That, that is very question. true. Uh, I'll give you one example. I, I, served, uh, I serve right now on the board of Loma Linda University as well as the board of Oakwood University. Um, but one of the newest health professional schools at Loma Linda is a school of pharmacy. And it is the school at which there is the, the smallest percentage of Seventh-day Adventists because Adventists have not typically thought a pharmacy as an area we think of medicine, dentistry, nursing, and now increasingly some of the allied health uh, professions, but th we don't think of pharmacy. And it's an example of where it, it's not one of the health professions we are focused on, and many of our young people never even think uh, of the possibility of that. I, I would say, um, assess what are your strengths, assess what are the things that, that appeal to you, and ask God to direct you. And if God is directing you in a path, follow that path and God is going to open the doors and make it possible to you. It, there is a certain sense of, of confidence you have if you feel that I, where you are now is where God has led you. And God never calls anyone to failure. He guarantees success. So if God has called you here, he is going to open the doors. You just got to be faithful, but he will open the doors. So it's, it's the sky is the limit uh, to what you can do is what I would encourage our young people to think. But don't, don't think only of what you want to do. Think of what God wants you to do. Yeah, like very, 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 very important point. And, you know, even in a time as this, as we live in, God is looking for Daniels and Josephs and you know, he's calling our young people to come out and really stand up for him, especially in a time like this. And the way the world is right now, we need our young people to stand up and represent God. Yes. And there's no I, limit. Our young people understand that there's no limit to what you can accomplish for God. I, I Growing up um, in, in a poor country, you know, never thought that I would be where I am today doing what, what I am doing. And that's why I, I don't give myself the credit, I, I give God the glory. And, and it really shows what is possible when you ask God to lead you, to direct you. Um, I, I love the, the text in Ephesians where it says that God will do for us exceeding abundantly above what we could ask or think. And, and that is the story. I, I, I give a TED talk, by the way, which, which has uh, um, over 1.7 million views. I gave it in 2017. And when I was given, when you were preparing for the talk, one of the things they asked you, they had a lot of little questions that they would use in developing your profile. They didn't use the question, my an this answer, but it said, if you were to pick a song, what would be the theme song of your life? And my theme song I picked was, My God is Awesome. Now, they didn't use that in the printed profile, but 
I think they were wanted to stay away from religious stuff, but that's okay. But but that is true. That is the theme song for my life. My God is awesome. My God is awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, it's been a great discussion. Um, there were so many nuggets that we were able to take away. You know, how God has brought you from a different country here. Uh, you went through Christian education. And, you know, you, you followed God's purpose for your life. Even though you didn't have a plan initially, but you followed his purpose. And look where God has brought you. And I just pray that God will continue to be with you, even in your career and your ministry, as you continue to work for him. Yes. Um, just just before you we, we close off, our time is far spent. We just have one last question that I want to throw out to Dr. Williams before you leave. Just one more. And that is, what what is a memorable lesson that you have learned on your journey so far? I, I was just thinking about that. One of the things I haven't talked about is perseverance. Because even when you are doing what God wants you to do, it doesn't mean that you will not encounter problems along the way. So let me go back with one example. There are many examples of this. But where you know I went to, to Canada and was working as a literature evangelist, you know, my first two weeks working as a literature evangelist in Canada, and we were working far north, 400 miles north of Toronto in the city of Timmins. And my, my roommate, a college roommate and, and myself, we would go out nine o'clock in the morning and we'd work till about 8.30 at night because the sun didn't set till about 9.30. So we had very long days. And the first two weeks working almost 12 hours, we sold absolutely nothing. Not one book, not one sale. And I, I can tell you that was beyond discouraging because we came in with all this optimism and we were going to be successful and we were going to do this and and we are going out and we are faithfully doing everything we were trained to do and we were getting into homes and we were making presentations and we were talking about books and we we had a, a sales pitch we would follow and do you think this would be helpful for you and your family they'd say yes do you think this is a good thing they'd say yes so they, they're following you all along so we think we get in the sale and when you come down to the end and you're saying well this is the cost and you can pay for it up front or you can pay for it on a payment plan. They said, I'm not interested. All along the way, they seemed very interested. And now I'm not interested. It, 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 it was beyond belief, discouraged. Um, and what do you do? We just didn't give up. If God has brought us here, we just didn't give up. One of the things we learned to do was to do it differently. We were going to the wealthier areas of town and not having any success. We shifted the areas we went and went to more of the working class areas, the poorer people. They bought books, not as many as we would have liked, and we were we did, but we did decently, not as gloriously as we thought we would do, but it all worked out in the end. But but I'm saying those two weeks, you work in more than 10 hours a day knocking on doors and visiting and so forth and 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 nothing to show um it was you we could have given up and said this is not going to work you don't give up if god has brought you here he has a plan he's gonna see you through don't give up just 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 try to work the plan that god has given you so i would say perseverance the fact that you're doing what god wants you to do doesn't mean you're not you will not encounter barriers and problems along the way but yes. no God who has brought you so far is going to see you through. Beautiful. I like that text that you mentioned earlier. Um, Psalms 37, 5, commit thy ways to the Lord and trust in him and he will, he will bring it to he will act. Yes. yes. So let's, I, I encourage all of our viewers to remember that. Mm -hmm. Commit your ways to God, no matter what it is that you're doing right now. Whatever it is you're trying to achieve, whatever path you feel like you're following, in, in God's footstep, just commit it to God and he will bring it to pass. Don't forget that as we begin this new year, as you start planning and setting goals for the new year, remember to commit your ways to the Lord. We just want to say a special thank you to Dr. Williams for taking yes. the time out of your Sabbath rest day to come and share this beautiful testimony with us and our viewers. We hope that you were encouraged. 
We hope that you were inspired. We hope that just, you know, you have the new energy and motivation to, to go forward and to live the life that God has called you to live. Thank you for joining us on the Source Talk Show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a great discussion, Michelle. Um, you know, there's there's always a testimony to be shared. And I'm glad that we're going to take the time over the next couple of months to hear so many more testimonies. So this is just part one of what's coming. So stay tuned. Um, and we really appreciate you, our viewers. Thank you for tuning in every single time. Uh, we'll be back here on January 22nd. And, you know, we are looking forward to hearing your um, contributions and your comments as well. Really appreciate you. So we're going to sign off. Um, Michelle, you want to close up in prayer at this time? Yes. Um, feel free to share the, um, the video and then we can close off in prayer. Okay. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for inspiring us today. Thank you for just reminding us that you are in our lives and you care about every part of our journey that we take on this earth. And I pray, Lord, that whatever journey we take, that that journey will lead us to you and lead us to spend the time in eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks again for joining us and thank you for tuning into the source where God is, that is who we look to. See you next See you time. Next time.